Musical Masterworks, a program dedicated to the rediscovery of great symphonic, instrumental, choral, operatic, cinematic, and electronic compositions from antiquity to the present, with your host, Mike Stratus. Good evening, this is Mike Stratus of Musical Masterworks, and tonight, stay tuned for a very special program. This won't be your typical musical program, because tonight, we are talking about the tomb of Alexander the Great. This is not going to be your typical musical program. There won't be an explanation about composers and their works. It's going to be a very straightforward conversation. And the topic of this conversation came up a while ago. I was very lucky to have the guest who's sitting here next to me uh, make a lecture at the Macedonian Study Center in Whitestone with the same topic. So I said this is a fantastic topic to have for conversation, and that is why tonight we have here with us Ms. Esmeralda Marikas, who has made Alexander the Great a major part of her life with tremendous passion. I think we all have that, right? Yes, Michael. First of all, it's a great pleasure to be here tonight, and thank you very much for inviting me. Of course, Alexander is every Greek's passion because Alexander is Greece. And Greece is the entire civilization. Alexander is a suburb evolution of the Greek spirit. And he's the most important figure of the ancient world. And a figure like him cannot be but a conception of a higher power. It says a lot about Alexander, the significance of his personality. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about just a typical person. We're talking about a legend, a constant legend that's there in front of us. Uh, Before we talk about uh, the tomb, and and, um, I'd like to skip the basic story in the beginning, his birth, his upbringing. We know that. That's straightforward. The part that I want to take the audience to is how he got to Egypt. And Alexander reaching Egypt is actually an interesting, one of the most interesting U-turns in the history of ancient times. Um, So what can you tell us about that? Well, Alexander reached Egypt after having conquered Minor Asia, Phoenicia, and Syria within seven days through the Gaza Strip. And he reached first the city of Pelusion, which was located on the eastern entrance of the Nile. The city of Pelusion was considered to be the key of Egypt. And as we know, the Persian satrap Mazakis handed over the entire territory of Egypt to Alexander without any resistance at all. And he also visited the western entrance of the Nile and also sailed around the Lake Mariut, Mareotis. The interesting thing is that in the western entrance of the Nile, the city of Canova was located. Uh, The Romans call it Canopo with a P. Right, Canopus. And an ancient temple of Hercules existed there way before the Trojan War. And, of course, we know that Hercules is Alexander's ancestor from his father's side. It's the dynasty of Iraklides, Dynastia ton Iraklidon. Yes, it's a big part of his uh, personality. I mean, we all know that the other side, through his mother, was Achilles. But from his father, clearly was Heracles. Heracles also Latinized as Hercules. Um, I think we just want to get back to the Memphis portion um, before we get to that, uh, the role of Heracles as a symbol in Alexander's life. After Mazakis, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Esmeralda, after Mazakis gave him the lands, I think there was an enthronement, if, if I'm not mistaken, he at Memphis. He wore the pharaonic crown, right, crown in the double in, in crown. The city. Yes. Yes. That's an amazing. Sent in ancient the Greek. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And he just walked in and mm-hmm. pretty much not a drop of blood was shed. That is just uh, yep. amazing you for the ancient world. You can resist if you see him coming like yes. that to Egypt. Yeah. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about the... Um, the Hercules. connection between Hercules and, uh, and, and the mythology of that time. Or well, the, the, the mythology that shaped Alexander, actually. Uh, or is it a mythology? Let's start with, uh, well, Hercules is mentioned by Homer in Iliad. He's mentioned by Isiod. And he's also mentioned by Plutarch. And as we know, Plutarch was not only a biographer, but most important He was a philosopher, and he was also an initiate in Delphi. So, and since you brought up the word mythology and mythos, mythos is not a lie. Mythos is word. 
And the verb mythume means I speak. It doesn't mean I lie. I lie is pseudome. So what is mythology? It's the knowledge of the ancient natural science and history hidden inside symbolisms and a deep secret theology. And in this context, I would like to mention Professor Mario Lacos. He frees mythology from the symbolisms and the theology and presents it to us based on science, based on geology. And actually, the first time we hear this word, geomythology, is in 1968, here in the United States, by the geomythologist Dorothy Vitaliano. That's fascinating. So if I could just clarify and put it in a summary for the audience that might think this is a little complicated. It's basically implying that what we somehow generally mistakenly call mythology as if it's just a beautiful little story that had no foundation is actually, according to the definition, more than that. It's actually a way of explaining mm -hmm. a past event which over time has taken on certain legendary that is correct, components. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I'm in fact, I, I've heard years ago that there actually was a Heracles. I mean, why would you have so many people in ancient Greece claiming to be descended from the sons of Heracles? I mean, mm -hmm. there's got to be something. Absolutely. So the geomythology concept for those explains listening. Explains everything. Explains things, but not necessarily as what we would say is a tall tale mm -hmm. or a legend. Wow, that's it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's true. In some ways, I guess you'd say it's a pre-Homeric way of explaining things because, I mean, Homer is really the first to put this down until you get to Herodotus, who then suddenly shifts mm -hmm. the whole conversation, if I'm not mistaken, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So let's, um, having said that, let's go back to Alexander in, in, in Egypt. And we know that there's one city of all cities that seems to have so much to do with his historical presence, and I'm talking about the great city of Alexandria. How does that come about? Well, let's talk, let's see why Alexander picked up yes. the area to yes. build the city. According to Plutarchos and Byzantius, he had a dream uh, while in Egypt. So he saw an older man reciting verses from Homer's Odyssey. And it was verse 354 from the fourth rhapsody. Nisos epitatis esti polyclisto, en ipondo Egyptu proparithe, pharon de ekikliskusin. It is an island in the waters in front of Egypt, and they call it Pharos. This man in Alexander's dream was Proteas. Mm, Proteus, who was protecting yes. the sea creatures in the area. He could also predict the future, but you had to force him to do that. So when Alexander woke up, according to the historians, he went to the area and said, Homer is also a great architect. Mm -hmm. And according, again, to um, a historian, Arianos, who is uh, Alexander's biographer, Alexander by himself made the city plan using barley seeds, and when these were eaten by birds of prey, he took it as a bad omen and wanted to step back. I, let me just interrupt for a second. Yeah. When you said he used barley seeds for our audience, I guess he used the barley seeds as a way of delineating the distances? Mm-hmm. Okay. The city plan and the, right. the but size. But why barley and seeds? I, I don't know. Wow. I don't know. That's what he found, and... He took them and just. I guess it started. allows the yeah. flexibility. Yeah. <laughs> but Shows the cranes. Flexibility anyway. But the cranes took care of that. Yeah, I don't yeah. know if they were cranes or whatever, or whatever. Bird. Yeah, whatever the yeah. birds they were. So he took it as a bad omen. He wanted to step back, but the priests told him to go on with his plan. And of course, we know Alexander was the most glorious city for about one thousand years. Yes. So the architect of Alexandria was Dinocrates. Yes. And the supervisor of the entire project was Cleomenes. And actually, Constantinople's city plan was based more on Alexandria and less on Rome. That's fascinating. People believe it's based on Rome, but it's based more on I Alexandria. I guess it's the fact that there are supposedly, I don't know for a fact if they are, seven hills. I mean, where was we have that is a, Yeah, that's a different which story. Which is the only thing yeah. I know. But outside but, of I mean, that, the structure. I mean, Rome is not coastal. Mm -hmm. And, and Alexandria is. That mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. The climate there was uh, amazing. 
excellent climate, and the area was also very good from a strate strategic, I'm sorry, point of view, because it was not easy for the enemies to get even close. And on the island of Faros, the island we uh, spoke about uh, before, there um, was the famous Faros des Alexandrias, the lighthouse yes, of Alexandria, right. with uh, which was built out of white uh, stone. The most important part of Alexandria was Vruchion, right. where the famous Vasilia were located. These were beautiful structures with a lot of trees. And in the southern part of the Vasilia, but inside the Vasilia, was the famous Soma, where the kings were buried. The Ptolemaic kings, the famous mm -hmm. dynasty that ruled till, what, 31 BC with Cleopatra's death? Mm -hmm. Amazing. I, what a continuity. Now, you said Soma, mm -hmm. and everybody today who speaks Greek would say Soma. Well, it's a word that means body. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I'm not mistaken, I did a little research on this. I think Soma means something in the Homeric sense, correct? What is the Homeric origin of that? It's the dead body. Ah. And this is why in later years, when Soma stopped meaning a dead body and means the body that is alive, that's why later historians, they don't use the word Soma as the grave anymore, but they use the word Sima, which means the mark, the grave, the pile right. of stones. Right. The interesting thing is, though, that in the old Homeric language, Soma was meaning the dead body, but the, the body that is alive was called Demas. And the Arabs call the area Kom el Demas, they're using the Homeric word, right. themas. So, komel themas is the grave, but it means the elevation of the bodies, the rising of the bodies. They're using the word body, but in plural, because them is for them is singular and themas is plural. I so, see. they're using, by calling the area komel themas, they're using an old Homeric word. Well, if if I'm not mistaken, and I think the audience should be aware, the Arabs came into the picture sometime in the 7th, the 7th century. century. So when they got there, this was already pre-established mm -hmm. titles and designations. Mm -hmm. So for them, it was just continuing what they heard. Exactly. Makes a lot of sense. So the Arabs play a big role in preserving so Absolutely. much of that. Absolutely. That's amazing. So um, the city was very, very rich with papyrus that could make everything from clothing to boats. They were making also incredibly beautiful carpets. Actually, the famous mosaic in Palestrina in Rome portrays an Alexandrian carpet. Um, we had beautiful jewelry as well. Yes. Unfortunately, ton of them were, tons of them were transported to Rome. And uh, unfortunately, the Emperor Octavian melted tons of them to steal the gold and the silver. They were working with glass as well. No. And uh, when Adrian went there. Hadrian, yes. Yeah, Emperor the, Hadrian, uh, the, the Roman uh, Emperor. Roman Emperor. Big Philhellene, from what I understood. I'm sorry? Well, he was a bit of a Philhellene. He, he yeah. was a big fan of the Greek world. Very, very. Yeah. And in his uh, palace in Tivoli, right. he has like a miniature of Canovo and uh, from Kilada uh, in Thessaly, Kilada ton Dembon, right. because he, he loved it so much, and from Athens, Pikilis Toa. So he was inspired by these three, um, uh, these three areas that he absolutely loved. That would be Hadrian's Villa in Tivoli. Hadrian's Villa. Hadrian's that Villa. Is correct. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And I think also we should uh, mention also Alexander's visit to the Temple of Ammon in Siwa. Yes, which is which in is Libya. Which is highly important. Correct. It's mm -hmm. in Libya. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. The high priest Psamon told him exactly. You have the grace of God from your father's side. Apotheou herin os apopatros. It was a wise decision to visit the temple. He didn't have to prove anything in Greece, but he did have to prove it in Egypt. Why? That he was a divine presence. Presence. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the most amazing points about the whole story of Alexander. And I don't want to get too much into it because I know we're going to talk about this with Libya. But the Greeks struggled with this. 
They yeah. could not. The whole proskinesis in Persia, if I recall, when the Persians were bowing down before, the Greeks were looking at uh, Alexander and saying, you're one of us. What, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. Almost as if Philip would have said the same thing. And yet, for the people that were uh, the new citizens of this empire he was creating, it was natural that he was viewed yeah, as a god. So how does this Siwa oracle, uh, I mean, how does this, I, I guess I'm, what I'm asking is, how does the Siwa oracle relate to the temples in Greece? And, 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 and how is it that in one case, the Greeks saw it one way and the other, the, the non-Greeks, the so-called barbarian world saw it another? What's the relationship between them? The relation between the temples of Greece and Egypt is extremely strong. First of all, Aristophanes, in his work, uh, The Birds, Stus Ornithes, he writes that the oracles of Ammon and Siwa are as important as the oracles of Apollo and Delphi. This is a lot. And Pindaros also, he he names Ammon Olympu Despota. Ammon is the Lord, the master of of Olympus. The Olympus, yes. And the connection between Greece and Egypt is extremely strong, I think. Explain that to me, because I, I there are some hints along the way. and um, Let's go to Plato. Well, yeah. Plato. The Timaeus, for instance. That is correct, yeah. Timaeus. Athens and Sais, the ancient city of Sais right. in Egypt, they were both created by the goddess Athena. The only difference is that Athens pre-existed size by 1,000 years. Wow. That, that says a lot. Mm-hmm. That says a lot. Um, I don't know. I remember years ago reading something about the relationship between Egypt and Greece involving Io or Io and uh, Epaphos and uh, all the mythology of that time period. Does this have anything to do with that connection? Is that proof of any kind of a Greco-Egyptian unity or continuity that the the, ancients knew? For me, the biggest proof is Plato. Hmm. And then let's go to Odyssey again, verse 232 from the fourth Rhapsody. The Egyptians believe that their ancestor is Paeon. And then Egypt, Egyptos and Danaos, they were twin brothers. That's correct, yes. But the strongest point is Plato, Timaeus. Athens pre-existed size by 1,000 years. That's amazing. That says a lot. That says a lot. It, it, it's just fascinating. I'm, I'm sitting here trying to move on, and I'm, and I'm just, the whole thought of that, because, you know, as a teacher, we always teach the river valleys and you know the Egyptians are the second oldest after the Sumerians, which are the Mesopotamian peoples. And then we get to the Minoans. We don't quite put that in the category. And yet you look at the dates, just Crete alone, mm-hmm. and you say to yourself, this is competitive in Absolutely terms of time. So now we go back to an older issue. I mean, I don't want to get too deep into this, but I even heard that there are pyramids in Greece. Of course they are. All over the world they are pyramids. You see, this is a a crypto history that I don't know what society's thinking, but I mean, we hear these. I mean, I never get the time to look at it, but I just find it fascinating. So I guess there's a lot to say about the relationship. And what about the prophecies about Alexander's coming? Well, there were a lot. First of all, a very big one was in Persia. Um, The prophecy was that a king will reincarnate as a young hero. And we know also Philip saw a sign of a lion on his wife's body. Mm. And the lion is a symbol of Hercules. Yes. And I think he's mentioned also in the Quran, uh, the master of the two horns. Dul Karnain. Dul Karnain, yes. yes. Uh, the second book of Daniel as well. Actually, Porphyrius, um, around 300 AD, believed that this book is not... It's not a genuine one, it's a fraud, and that it was written way later by the Maccabees, so it's not a prophecy anymore. But the interesting thing is that there is a prophecy of David. According to the Jewish archaeology by Flavius Josephus, Right, Josephus. uh Alexander visited Jerusalem, and the high priest of the temple read to him the prophecy of David, 
according to which a Greek will conquer Asia. Right. And in this context, I would like to mention Professor Grigoraku. Uh, she has done the most important research about the Hellenistic cities in Asia. And also there is a great French book, uh, L'Orient Hellenisé. Very the interesting. The Hellenized Orient. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Or oh, the East, yes. Mm -hmm. I find this fascinating. I mean, I, I always remember when I was a young man, I somebody got me a coin with the head of Alexander the Great, the profile. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget. It was always it was weird. The, the cornucopia that was oh. on the side of the head. And I never quite knew the significance. I said, all right, maybe it's some kind of symbolism with Zeus or something. And, and, Amun. and it turned out it's Amun, mm -hmm. Zeus Amun in, mm -hmm. in Siwa. But it's more than that. It, it's, it's the prophetic symbol that all these cultures I point to to say he is the prophesized mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. Correct? That is correct. Wow. Well, we're getting a lot of wonderful details, ladies and gentlemen. If you just tuned in, this is uh, Mike Stratus with my guest here, Esmeralda Maricas, and we're talking about the tomb of Alexander the Great. We've been talking a lot about the the lead up to the uh, tomb itself, uh, the conditions around Alexander's uh, move into Egypt and the prophecies as well. Uh, so let's now get to the details about his final days. And um, I guess when he, I guess it all started prophecies in India, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, of course, all these details are known to us from the royal newspapers. Uh, there was a prophecy in India that he would die very young, and he would die by one of his own people. Wow. And that says would, a lot. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But I would like to mention something here. When he reached India, he found there Greeks in the ancient city of Nyssa from Dionysus' time. This is amazing. So um, then we also know that by the time of his death, all of a sudden a star and an eagle appeared. Mm -hmm. The eagle is the symbol of Zeus. Right. And uh, also that the statue moved in Babylon. It was the big statue of Zeus, and it moved by the time of his death. So according to his closest friend, Iphestion, who died shortly before Alexander, Alexander himself, while in Egypt, had chosen to be buried in Alexandria because a priest in Rakot, Rakot was a, a town, right. which was incorporated in Alexandria, and it's exactly in the southwestern part of Alexandria where the Serapion was built. Right. So a priest in Rakot had told Alexander, you will reside there, dead and alive, because you will have the city that you're building as your grave. So according to Iphestion, Alexandria wanted to be buried in Alexandria wow. because of this prophecy. So all the conversation then about the death in Babylon in June of 323 BC. I think it was June 6th. I'm not sure the date. Oh, uh, it was June 13. That, in essence, was really not Alexander's wishes. It was the argument between the generals, if I'm not mistaken, until Ptolemy uh -huh. made the surprise move, the uh -huh. ambush, so to say. That is correct. But you're, but you're saying that it was based, Ptolemy was probably based on not only to support his position in Egypt, but also to fulfill Alexander's request. Yeah, and also, you know, even if he didn't want to fulfill Alexander's request, by bringing him there, he becomes also a divine person. Yes, yes. In the land Ptolemy of the, the gods, yes. 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 As being, you know, one of the family. So according to all the historians, he was indeed buried in Alexandria. And let's start with Strabon. Strabo, yes. I'm sorry? In English, we say Strabo. Okay, I'm yes, so that's sorry. Okay. No, no, I'll, know, I'll yeah. do that. Don't worry. Don't feel bad. Okay. According to uh, Strabo. <laughs> Strabo, yes. Ptolemy I brought the body to Egypt, and uh, Strabo went to the grave, and he said that he's there now, but not in the same sarcophagus, because Ptolemy I had put him in a, gla in a golden sarcophagus, but Ptolemy IX stole the gold, and placed Alexander's body in a glass sarcophagus. So we're talking about 300 years later. Wow. And uh, Stra Strabo uh, tells us, writes that he's there. Wow. 
And he also mentions the Soma, the burial site of the kings. And he tells us that all the kings are buried there, including Alexander. And this is in the middle of the city. Right. And you can't miss something like that. No, I mean, never. I mean, that's a tourist site today. That, that is correct. <laughs> you can't go away from that. So he visited it about 300 years later. Right. So the Roman Suetonius as well. Right. He describes Julius Caesar's visit to the tomb. And he also speaks about the Soma, which is the burial site of the king, in the middle of the city. Let's go now to the Greek sophist Zenobius. Zenobius? Zenobius. Yes. He speaks also about the Soma in the middle of the city. And he speaks about Alexander being buried there. So does Lucianos. Lucian of Samosata, right? Uh, yep. <laughs> he, Lucianos. Yes tells us that Julius Caesar visited the grave, and he describes Julius Caesar's visit. Probably with Cleopatra at his side, don't you think? Uh, excuse me? Probably with Cleopatra as his escort, his chaperone to the uh, event. I have no idea if they went together. I mean, well, I mean, if, I, if, a little sidestepping here, but I was, Should um, have been, yeah. Julius Caesar was there to get involved in the whole civil war that was mm -hmm. going on between her and her brother, and I think he chose her, and at that point, I think she gave him a little tour around the town. Makes a lot of sense. It does. Yeah. A very important also, um, uh, very important is what Vion Cassius, the historian, writes. In his uh, work, Roman History, yes. he describes Octavian's visit to the tomb. And it is very important because they wanted to show him around and show him all the other graves of all the other kings, but he flatly refused. He wanted to see only the king and not the dead. Mm, yes. He said, Vasilea alune cruz idin epithemisen. That means the king only. I want to see the king, and I don't want to see any of the dead. So for Octavian, the king is only Alexander, and everybody else is dead, mm. but not Alexander. He's immortal. That's amazing. It is. It's a great statement. We have also a marble fragment uh, from the island of Paros, which was discovered in the early 20th century. And we can read there that Alexander was first placed in Memphis because the the area, the, the Soma and the, the grave and everything were not completed. And Alexander was embalmed, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Yes. Let's mention that he yes. was. Yes. And that's why everybody was seeing him. In, yeah. That's an industry right mm -hmm, there. Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Irodianos, Irodianos, Irodianos. Yes. He describes Caracalla's visit to the tomb. And he writes that he was wearing a red mantle and a lot of jewelry, and he took up, he removed the mantle and he removed the jewelry, and he placed everything on the tomb. He thought he was uh, Alexander's reincarnation, by the yeah, way. Well, <laughs> he needed to see a doctor, but that's not a story. Uh, he needed to see a doctor, yeah. <laughs> so um, what is highly important is that Caracalla's father, Septimius Severus, yes, who was born in Syria, by the way, in yes. the city of Homs, mm -hmm. sealed the tomb. But before he sealed the tomb, he brought inside valuable scripts from the ancient temples. That is amazing. And it is amazing because I found somebody 800 years later, Xifilinos, who writes the same thing. And he says that the reason he did that is because he didn't want anybody anymore to see the body or to read what is written inside the sanctuary. Mite midisto soma tutu idi, mite ta entisaditis yegramena analexite. What was the nature of that writing? Was there anything about it that was so... To protect them. To protect them. So... Um, the Copts, I forgot the Copts. Yes, the Copts. They have manuscripts, mm -hmm. and all the manuscripts uh, say the same thing. Yes. Alexander is there. What is very interesting now is that over the grave, the first Christians built, built a small church, tiny church. Mm -hmm. And when the city fell under the Arabs in the 7th century, as you mentioned mm -hmm. before, they transformed this little church into a mosque, and they named it Julkarnain. Yeah. All the educated Arabs knew 
that Alexander is buried there. Amazing. And the less educated Arabs knew that somebody very important died in Babylon and he was buried there. Let's go now to Leo the African. And I'm talking about 1517. He's a very famous Muslim historian and traveler more than very, that, right? Yeah. yeah, description of Africa. Yes. He speaks about a grave honored by the followers of Muhammad. And he writes that this is Alexander's tomb, who was a king and a prophet. And he speaks about the middle of the city. Again, we have the Soma here, mm. the middle of the city. Pointing it out. And 30 years later, Marmol says the exact same thing like Leo the African in his work, De l'Egypte. Mm -hmm. Amazing. It really is amazing. Well, I think we need to take a break for the news from Greece, but we will definitely be back with some of this, with more of this fascinating conversation after we hear the news. So let's take it away. Welcome back to Musical Masterworks with your host, Mike Stratus. But tonight, it's a special edition of Musical Masterworks, and I have as my guest, as you've been hearing before the news, Esmeralda Mouricas, who has been enlightening us about the history of the tomb of Alexander the Great, its location, the historical record, the individuals who attest to its uh, specific location in Egypt, in Alexandria. Fascinating to hear this, because... Um, we, we, we've been finding a lot of archaeological things, uh, including King Philip's uh, tomb or, uh, you know, a lot of the tombs that we've been hearing about lately in King Tut in Egypt and so many other famous people. But Alexander the Great's tomb is the one thing that still escapes us. And um, we were talking about this, uh, Esmeralda, before the break about the more recent historical proofs. Can you continue on that? Well... In the year 1717, Louis Moreri, in the first tome of his historic dictionary, writes that in the center of the city, a mosque exists over a grave. The word turbe is mentioned there. Turbe is the Turkish word for a grave. It's a turbe. Yes. And not any grave. It's a significant grave. Mm -hmm. And Moreri writes that the Turks call it Skender, so Sikander, they say it's Alexander. Alexander's grave. Right. As we know, Alexanderia is uh, uh, right. uh, Alexandria. Right. I mentioned before that over the grave, the first Christians built a tiny church. On the seventh century, when the city fell under the, the uh, Arabs, this tiny church was transformed into a mosque. And the name of the mosque was Jules Carnain, the master of the two horns, huh? Right, the two horns, yes. What is interesting now is that in the late 18th century, so after Moreri wrote his article in the Historic Dictionary, this little mosque was made a lot bigger and was given a new name, Nabi Daniel. And they said that two people are buried there, the prophet Daniel and a fabulist, El Hakim. But Daniel is not buried there. You're Daniel the was Daniel. buried. Yes, yes, the prophet Daniel yes. is buried in Susa. Right. So why did they change the name of the mosque from Jul Karnain to Nabi Daniel? That's a good question. <laughs> and in the 19th century, this mosque was made even nicer, even bigger, even um, they, they, uh, they, they renovated it. Right. I think under Muhammad Ali. Yes, yes. So what is interesting now is that a very prominent member of the Alexandrian society, Ambrosius Kilitsis, in the year 1850, he went to the basement of the mosque and he ran across a rusted locked door. But through a tiny opening, he was able to see a body in a glass sarcophagus, surrounded by lots of scripts. The guide who was with him pulled him back, and when Skilitsis exited the mosque, he went to see the patriarch. The patriarch back then was Ierotheos. He also went to see the Russian uh, consul, and he told them what he had seen. Both the Patriarch Hierotheos 
and the Russian consul, they both decided to stop further investigation. And Ambrosius Kilitsis was never given permission to enter the basement wow, of the mosque that anymore. Is, that is fascinating. I, uh, you hear that and you say to yourself, why is that possible? Why is this such a... I, I'm, I'm assuming the man saw something of extreme importance. Why is it they just dropped it like that? I, I just, I, I don't know. It boggles the mind. All right, well, I guess we'll, we won't have an answer. Do we have an answer? I don't think so. Nothing obvious. Well, we do and we don't Okay, have. <laughs> all right. In the year 1867, the archaeologist and astronomer Mahmoud al-Falaki also insisted that the grave is there. But for me, the most important point is Heinrich Schliemann. Yes. The famous, the biggest archaeologist uh, who was... German archaeologist. Uh, he was German. Yes. And he, you know, he, he almost died two times. As a child, he got very sick. And then he sailed, and the boat sunk. Wow. Was this on the way to the United States? Yeah. And oh. uh, he was saved twice. Wow. So he was passionate about he was, Greece. very much. They accused him because he was not a professional archaeologist. Right. But his passion proved to be correct. Yes. He excavated Troy. Big stuff. Mykines, Tirins, and I think he went also to Ithaki and Orhomenos. But till then, nobody believed that Homer's Iliad was really true. And thanks to this man, we have the proof now, mm. both with Troy and Mekines. Yes. So he wanted to go to the basement, but he was never allowed to. He, never, he was never given a permission to do that. My personal opinion is that one day the tomb will be opened because nothing stays hidden under right. the sun. Right. The thing is that the day the tomb will be opened, history will turn around. And uh, let's remember the great novelist Bernard Shaw in his work, The Devil's Disciple. What will history say? History, sir, will lie as usual. <laughs> We lie as usual. It's sad. I'll tell you something else, Esmeralda. I feel that the discovery of the papyrus alone, I mean, these, I, I would assume it's a very large number of papyri, I mean, that are placed in this location. We all talk about how the burning of Alexandria was one of the greatest catastrophes, intellectual catastrophes of the ancient world. In fact, from much of human history, to recover some of these works that might have been put in the burial spot of Alexander the Great and to find them. I mean, that alone, never mind the body of Alexander, which is the biggest thing, but just to get to the papyrus and to find missing works that I remember reading about as a young man, you know, lost tragedies and, and comedies and poems and histories, the histories that are lost. I mean, maybe Plato's Timaeus, which talks about you know, the Atlantis story, which he learned in Egypt. And maybe there's something there. Maybe we'll find a papyrus. Of course it is. Uh, that's, that's the part of the of story that's is. just amazing. Uh, it would be an intellectual revolution. Uh, um, and then, of course, there's the body of Alexander. I mean, I mean, just to have that. I mean, I don't know. I guess it's just an amazing possibility. And when the time comes, I'm sure we're going to have to take a break and take a deep look and, you know. Take a deep breath. <laughs> and as Xifilinus write, writes, excuse me, they were hidden so that nobody sees the body and nobody reads what's written inside the sanctuary. Wow. Wow. A mystery in itself. Well, I have to tell you, this has been a very enlightening night, even though I have in the past had the pleasure of hearing... Uh, Esmeralda make the presentation. I have to tell you, there's always something new that comes up, and uh, I'm just so thankful she's here today at my show, Musical Masterworks. And uh, Esmeralda, is there anything you'd like to say as we close? Yeah, I remember Churchill now. Oh. He said, by the time the truth has put on her slacks, the lie will have traveled around the world. <laughs> <laughs> Leave it to Churchill. Always has Leave something witty. Always has something witty to say. 
Uh, well, thank you so much, I Esmeralda. thank you very, very much, Michael, for inviting me. Thank it's, you. It's our pleasure, and we look forward to having you again in the future. Thank you very much. We, you have been listening to a very special edition of Musical Masterworks with the story of the tomb of Alexander the Great. I look forward to being here again in two weeks. If any questions, please call 718-204-8900. Until then, have a wonderful night. <laughs>